Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CBIS for another lecture. Thank you, Martin, for being here. So the lecture today is called Reconnecting Communities, the Highway to Nowhere, a highway that fractured communities and displaced residents of West Baltimore. Martin French, which we have the, the honor of having here today, has worked for the Baltimore City Planning Department since 2004. After five years in its research and strategic planning division, where he was a, con a contributor to the Live, Earn, Play, Learn, the city's comprehensive master plan, he began working in its land use and urban design division at the department's representatives um, at zoning hearings. Apart from this principal responsibility, Martin is part of the LUUD team advising developers and citizens about possible developments of or redevelopments and how zoning may shape outcomes of those ideas and presenting zone, uh, reports of zoning legislations to the planning commission. Before joining planning, Martin worked for several decades in the subsidized housing field of the Housing Authority of Baltimore City and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. His career started with a BA in geography from John Hopkins University. He is a 50 years resident of the Baltimore area 20 of them in the city. Uh, furthermore, Martin was so gentle to walk my students and myself uh, through the highway, highway to Noor last, uh, last semester. So I'm really excited to hear his lecture. Thank you very much, Martin, for being here. The audience is yours. I will move this. The audience and the screen and the next event. Here you go. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm not accustomed to this new technology, so I made some mistakes. I apologize in advance. Uh, our subject today is something that, of course, is an infrastructure question, a highway. Uh, it's also, quite frankly, an urban battle scar. It's the best way to describe it. Uh, I had an interest in this, of course, uh, both uh, as a planner wishing to be, and then eventually uh, I did join the planning department. The issue of where do cities choose to route their transportation networks and how does that affect some of the built environment that's already there and the people who live here. So this particular topic I'm addressing is why did Baltimore City choose this particular location and why did it build it at all? <clears throat> and I'm going to go back a good ways in Baltimore City's history. Basically back to the Civil War uh, after 1865. And Baltimore City was a rapidly growing port at that point. It had been founded more than 100 years earlier, and it depended as a port on roads, turnpikes, as they were called then. And then during the 19th century, once the railroads began to be built, Baltimore uh, merchants invested in railroads to be sure that they had links to their hinterland, as we would now call it out to the north and to the west of the city. There was a steady network growing and a steady demand for more and more products to be passed back and forth between ships that were taking them somewhere else and part of it to be brought in and taken back to the hinterland, to the farmers and the settlers the north and west of Baltimore City. So the city was originally separated from Baltimore County in 1851. Uh, it was given the status of a county meant that it was no longer responsible to Baltimore County and vice versa. And Baltimore County was rural and did not wish to, quite frankly, become urbanized in those days. Uh, so this map you see here, I hope, will show you the original Baltimore City of 1851, which is the nicely colored small section, uh, approximately 10 square miles. And surrounding it is an orange area known as the Belt. Uh, it was an area that was offered by Baltimore County for annexation to the city so it could be developed. And if you look at the northwest uh, portion of this, that's where Julieville Park is today. The boundary of the original city is North Avenue today, it's North Boundary Avenue then. And off to the northeast is another large gray patch, and that is Brooklyn Park today. Of course, County residents weren't enthused about joining the city at that time because the city's property tax rate was twice the county's property tax rate. So they voted no. 
third time the city offered some tax breaks. Very specifically, the tax break was a vote come in for 20 years after your property taxes would be based upon the county tax rate, not the city tax rate. So the western and northern portions agreed to come in, the eastern side did not, and that's the area that's now Highland Town, uh, eastern part of Canada, Green Town. Baltimore City was also a tremendously growing area as part of the east coast of the United States. It, uh, in the time of the Civil War, 1860, had over 200,000 inhabitants. Of those, only about 1%, a little over 2,000 people, were actually enslaved. Of course, slavery was abolished during the course of the Civil War. And Baltimore basically continued to grow dramatically after that. This map shows the outline of the current city, which is 81 square miles, and how it grew from its original size. Darkest black sections on this map are Baltimore Town, uh, the westernmost or leftmost part on this map, uh, around the Inner Harbor, <clears throat> Old Town or Jonestown, which is on the eastern side of the Unified Blob, which you see in black on here, north of the Inner Harbor, and then Bells Point, which is the separate black area off to the right of that east area. Bells Point, of course, was not just uh, a port area, it was also a shipbuilding area. But after the Civil War, Bells Point shipbuilding basically became obsolete because ships were no longer wood, they were made out of steel. And Bells Point did not have the capacity for a steel mill to uh, deal with that. The roads that came in and out are still the same as they were pretty much established in the colonial days and in the early days of Maryland. And that is, you had bikes, spokes, I'm sorry, spokes coming out. From the city center and radiating in all directions. In the course of the western side, uh, that road was Frederick Road. And that would eventually become a corridor for truck traffic coming from Western Maryland. And it was important as the city grew and as technology changed, of course, and as motor vehicles began to appear, that something be made to replace that particular turnpike. With a road that was more compatible for today's modern motor vehicle traffic. And the other thing I would add here is, of course, that wherever these roads were at that time were farms, but of course the farmers began to sell out one by one, developers. So there became industry, there became commercial buildings, and there became lots of residential areas. Baltimore City was laid out starting from 1822 onward under something called the Poppleton Plan. Poppleton was an English surveyor. He was hired by the Baltimore City Council to lay out a plan for developing the city because they knew it was going to grow. And this is an example of the Poppleton Plan flattening process. On the left, you'll see a typical plat. And what is distinctive about it in modern terms is the variety of economic strata can be represented in a single block of properties. The large lots, both the widest and the deepest, were intended, of course, for the people who could afford to pay the most for the housing that they would have built on them. Medium-sized lots with the people in the next tier of income level down. And the smallest lots on the back streets were intended for the poorest people. <clears throat> and in Baltimore City's context, poorest people at the time could be black, could be white. Often they were immigrants, newly arrived in the United States. So the blocks were a way in which people of different economic levels and, quite frankly, of different races lived together, didn't necessarily always socially interact. They were there physically together. And this is a view of the plat as seen from the air today. What is there? Um, it was, of course, a world without zoning. So whatever somebody wanted to buy a lot for and use it for, it was pretty much up to him. If he had the money, he could build on it where he wanted and he could use it the way he wanted. Once the belt was annexed after 1888, Baltimore City now had a much larger area. It had grown from 10 square miles to 30 square miles. And there was a change happening socially in the United States, in Baltimore. And that change was that the next generation of Blacks who were moving up the economic ladder were beginning to look at some of those lots 
where they previously had only been able to occupy the back street lots and think about, well, you know, if we've got the money, we could probably get a better place and a bigger place and so on. Baltimore City was organized politically in what were called wards. A lot of cities in the United States use that system. And Things were happening also. Uh, Streetcars were becoming electrified. And this was opening up new opportunities for residential development in particular, well away from the city. No longer were people bound by how far they could walk from home to work or from home to the market. Now they could get on a streetcar and ride. And this was going to have an effect also, which was who gets to move into the new areas. Baltimore, of course, being an old city, uh, was also one in which a lot of the housing was, by this time, well over 100 years old. And you have to remember housing conditions at that time when houses were first built. You bought a house, it was built, let's say, in the 1870s. You had a house with fireplaces. There was no central heat. You burned coal in the hearth. Each room you wanted to heat. And if you didn't want to heat a room, you just didn't by fire in there. Um, <clears throat> there was also, of course, no indoor plumbing, as we know it today. A few lucky people actually had running water by this time, but it was cold water. So, in the wake of the great exposition, Columbia World's Fair Exposition in 1892 and 93, a lot of people across the United States took a look at the examples of the buildings of the future that were built at that time. We thought, boy, we'd love to have some of those too. We could replace our slums with things like that. So it was vision. And this translated at the federal level to the first US Commissioner of Labor, who was tasked by the president with developing criteria for identifying slums. At this point, nobody really thought in a careful way about how you identify a slum. And you sort of knew what it was when you were there, but how would you describe it so that it was different from other housing that might be nearby? So, first the U.S. Commissioner of Labor came up with criteria for identifying properties that were slums in cities in the United States. And he used Baltimore as one of four cities who tested his, his plan on his, his rating scheme. And Interestingly enough, to us today, the first criteria we picked was ethnic background. Keeping in mind that Baltimore is a port, it's getting immigrants coming into the United States, mostly from Europe at this point. It's also getting immigrants internally from other parts of the United States, many of whom at this stage are Black. They're come, beginning to come up out of the South. Then the other criteria, the employment pattern, housing conditions, sort of a an obvious one to us today. The health statistics, such as they were, which were kind of scarce at that point, but they were beginning to collect statistics. The rents that were charged and the crime rate, um, which basically they got by looking at the court rolls, seeing who got arrested and where it wasn't. And so Baltimore City had seven areas identified by Commissioner as slum areas. And the concept was basically. We've designated the slums. Now you figure out how to get them out of there and build something beautiful there. But the important thing for the evolution of this process was the pattern of using race, ethnicity, and jobs or employment as criteria to help identify slums was being set. So long before anybody got to think about whether there should be a highway in those Um Obviously, the other thing is you notice this is Bell's Point. Uh, the area off to the southwest was a chromium smelting plant. So it was not residential and therefore it was not considered a slum property. Uh, but now I'm going to fast forward basically to the Great Depression. And mortgage banking had crashed in the end of the 1920s. And housing construction had crashed with it. Sounds familiar? Yep, happens today too, doesn't it? And so the federal administration was determining how do we get 
the banking sector back on its feet? How do we get the housing construction sector back on its feet? Both of which will help employ a lot of people who don't have jobs right now. This is the pit of the Great Depression in the mid 30s, 1930s. So the federal government. Federal agency that was going to issue the mortgage insurance. So they created these maps. These maps were done uh, on the basis of instructions given to appraisers. We went out in uh, over 200 cities in the United States and uh, determined what areas were considered safe for mortgage insurance and what areas were considered not safe for mortgage insurance. In least safe areas, Given a red color, this gave rise to the term red one. The not a very good risk areas, given a yellow color, sort of like traffic lights of today, if you think about it. And then the safest areas where the federal government would be very happy to ensure more, just given blue and green colors. And in Baltimore's context, the blue and green colors generally match areas that had been given racial covenants something that had started uh, in the early uh, 1910s. And the areas that got the red usually had a very high proportion of Blacks and first-generation arrival immigrants. The areas that were in yellow were, in many cases, as you could have seen from the Hobbleton Plan flat, areas that also had the mix of races inherently in the housing because of the economic differences that went with that. Now, at the same time, the United States wants to build some highways. Uh, there's steady pressure from the early 1920s onward to improve highways. Uh, motor trucks are the new thing now. They replace the horse and wagon. They can go faster, they can carry a bigger load. Uh, so, highway planners started to look forward. If we're going to create new roads, we basically have two choices. We can widen roads that are already there, or we can build completely new roads on completely new paths. And so they started to look at these maps also, because where would be the easiest place to put a new highway back? Wherever the property value was the worst. As you pay the least to acquire property. Another thing that uh, Baltimore had to deal with, of course, in the Depression, was a lot of people were out of housing because their places were being foreclosed on and they had to vacate. So there was a lot of overcrowding. And in addition, uh, slum clearance was finally seen as a way to put people back to work as part of the New Deal, the New Depression. So, once again, the federal government instructed the cities, you want to use slum clearance money, identify where you intend to use it. Tell us. And this is an example of such a thing. The Housing Authority of Baltimore City was given federal money to build public housing, and it was housing for families only. There. And they had to come up with their criteria for how they chose where they wanted to build public housing. And Fourth criterion here basically reflects the type of thing that was first identified by the Commission of Labor back in 1893, but kind of brought up to date because of covenants and things of that nature. Concentrations of low income Negroes who could rarely buy a house and were segregated in rental districts. They couldn't buy a house because they couldn't get mortgage insurance. To move to the areas that they might have wanted to move to. They couldn't move to a lot of the areas they wanted to because racial covenants said you can't live here, you can't buy here. And people who look back on that era and say, you know, racial covenants were much more thorough as a way to exclude people you didn't want in your neighborhood. The city had tried a racial segregation ordinance for housing, but it basically said who could live there. It didn't say who could own it. But the 
covenant went further and said who gets to own the property as well as the This map basically is to update all of that and show that as of 1940, there was a large part of Baltimore City that was being looked at, quite frankly, as an area for potential redevelopment in all kinds of ways, not just public housing and slum towns. Again, factors that were used to create the map. The final factors listed here deal directly to the non white population and the recently arrived foreign born population. One thing that people often assume is that everything they got torn down during that time must have been pretty shabby. Fact is, federal government was good enough to document everything before they tore it down. And these are two examples in Baltimore City of buildings that were demolished to make way for public housing. These were considered slum properties. And if you were able to look closely at the photograph on the left, <clears throat> you'll see that there is, of course, what we would call today a corner store, a convenience store in, on the street level, the first floor level. Up above, it's kind of hard to see it, but in the windows, there's a sign for a dentist's office. The top floor has nothing, and presumably there's an apartment. One of the key things in property acquisition, condemnation, as it was called, was their price had to be paid to the owner of the property for taking his property. That was a constitutional requirement. What was not covered by that requirement was anything for the tenant. The tenant was a business. You know, you got some time to get out of it. You're getting out of here. Go find another place to be. If the tenant was a resident, you might get 30 days notice to go find another place to live. Buildings coming down. So this is the type of thing that was going on at that time. And quite frankly, it continued pretty much until 1970, which was an important thing to realize history in Baltimore City when land buildings were being condemned and taken the highway development. Another factor that came into play was zoning. Zoning was finally approved in the mid-1920s by the U.S. Supreme Court as a constitutional uh, restriction or limitation on property rights. And Baltimore City, like many other cities, created zoning maps. The separation of land uses was Essentially three industrial, commercial, residential. And the principle of zoning was if we can separate these land uses physically, geographically, things will be better. <clears throat> but one of the factors that everybody looked at and looked at slum areas as they've been designated was they're a jungle. They've got people living next to factories, they've got you know all kinds of problems like that. That must be why they're so bad. It's because everything's all mixed up like that as a land use. So zoning was intended to correct that. Problem was zoning could not be used to force land uses that were no longer something that could be built there or added there to leave. The local government under the constitution basically had two choices. You can either allow it to continue forever or you can buy it out. Baltimore City did not have money to buy anybody out in those terms. So the term non-conforming use was created. However, Baltimore City chose to zone a lot of areas that were residential, ways other than residential. And that's the purpose of showing this area. And there are significant areas you begin to see now, perhaps where the alignment for the highway to nowhere is starting to emerge. This is an area that's not totally protected by residential zone. Now, slum clearance did have its altruistic side. We use this photograph on the top right to explain to people how important it was that it actually did get done. In today's uh, environment, this is an example of housing that was built before the days of indoor plumbing and all those little shed things on the back lock lines are the outhouses. And <clears throat> outhouses, of course, have to be cleaned out periodically. And a lot of these houses were built without what we call sally ports. So the clean out actually involved walking from the front door to the back door out to the outhouse and back to the house again. Not a pleasant thought. Obviously, the better off people didn't have this problem because they had longer lots, the outhouses were not close to the house, and sometimes they had a back alley as well. 
But this is an example of what slum clearance is intended to solve. The other map, map on the left side, shows the areas that the city was designating uh, in, in the uh, early 1950s as urban renewal areas. And in bright orange, you'll notice there's one called Harlan Park on the left side. And south of it, you see a large gray area called conservation. District. At that time, the majority of that conservation district was white. Holland Park was black, with black and little class. Uh, obviously, they also had back streets, so they had a lot of low income as well. But it was a mix, economically speaking. And the city basically was lining up the area in between the two in the dividing line. And in terms of the public housing that was built, it was placed very specifically for the large part in minority areas, black areas. This was because of federal policy. The federal government at that time required greatly segregated public housing. You didn't have a choice. You wanted your federal money, Built white public housing, you built black public housing. It was called color public housing in those days, but the concept was the same. And that continued until 1962, and President Kennedy signed an executive order ending that type of thing. But the pattern was set. And if you look at these on the map, there are only three white public housing developments on this map. Two of them are on the east side, which is Claremont. And Ladonna Heights, and one is down in the south, Brooklyn Mills. The rest were all black public housing. This will have a fact also, you'll see, because where is that highway going to slam in right between two black public housing buildings? Urban renewal, basically, as I've alluded to, prepared people to leave when they weren't prepared to leave. It was basically saying, you've got to get out, you can go somewhere else. We may try to help you find a place, and we may give you some open relocation assistance. By and large, the people who had to move were left on their own to find their own places. Now, the city did help, we did counsel them where we looked, and there were some landlords who took advantage of that, quite frankly. And they chose to let the city know. No, I've got this house, I just cut it up into apartments, so I'd be happy to take a few of your folks who need to find a new place. So the city helped feed, unfortunately, some of the slum area that was happening. For businesses, it was a disaster. You know, it was basically a death sentence, commercially speaking, if you were told you had to relocate the business. Especially if your business was walking trade, your walking trade just got dispersed. Now we come to the interstate highway construction boom. Uh, it started in the mid 1950s when the federal government passed the National Defense Highways Act in 1956. The highway planners and a number of other people had taken a look at, quite frankly, Nazi Germany, the Autobahn system that the Nazis created for the purpose of moving troops very quickly from one place to another uh, using motorized vehicles. We thought, you know, that would work for us too. Not necessarily to move the army around, but if we had to, we could move the army around. But to move a lot of people around. So the interstate highways, even though they were called national defense highways, were to sweep and till for some of the people who had to vote in favor of it, um, they weren't really intended for the military. Baltimore City was responsible for planning where and how to locate the interstate highways inside Baltimore City. Federal government gave to the states the job of planning interstate highways. The state of Maryland gave the job of planning interstate highways inside the city limits for the Baltimore City Guard, which was kind of unusual. Uh, in, in many other cities in this country, the state kept on that power. They did not delegate it to the local government. But Baltimore City had a lot of political clout. It had six out of 32 state senators at that point. So the governor sort of had to pay attention. And one of the concepts that became really controversial was this one, which was to have a junction of interstate highways in downtown Baltimore 
There will be I-95 coming up from the southwest. There will be I-95 coming down from the northeast. They meet somewhere in the middle of Baltimore City. There will be I-83, the Jones Falls Expressway, coming down the Jones Falls and meeting the I-95s. And coming in from the west, the Interstate 70, all the way down from Frederick, West Maryland, into Baltimore City. And again, meeting at the Inner Harbor, we call it today. Um, at that time, the Inner Harbor was not a place of glamour. It was a place of abandoned buildings to a large extent because the old shipping trade it depended upon it disappeared. So from an economic point of view, it didn't look like there was going to be a lot of harm done this thing. And there was no vision at that moment of what a really pretty waterfront looked like. So the highway planners basically brought up these plans and the uh, this, this particular plan doesn't show it. Uh, there are several versions of these plans. The interstate highways that were proposed at this junction area were going to be like LA freeways. They were going to be like eight, ten lanes elevated and lots of, as you can see, what we now call mixing bowls, spaghetti type. Uh, fortunately, for some people, this didn't happen. But because Baltimore City had the power to condemn property to make way for the new road pathways, it did. And it was buying housing and other properties. And the displacement of families rose from about 800 a year, about 1961 or two, to 2,600 a year by the end of the 60s. And just think for a minute about how many people that means had to go somewhere else. The other thing that uh, <clears throat> we like to note, benefit of today, is how little has changed in some ways. The 1964 report on blight, Baltimore City Department Head Commission, designated certain areas as totally blighted, and you can see them shown in red here. And Baltimore City first launched what's called its housing market typology, the estimate. The investment foundation in Philadelphia was looking for a place to put money to work where it could make a difference in uplifting neighborhoods. Patterns were remarkably similar to that. The lowest value properties were and where the designated light was 50 years ago. Now we get to the actual politics of what happened. Uh, <clears throat> the city, as I said, is expanded. I didn't mention the date, 1919, January 1st, 1919, to its present size of 81 square miles. City of 1888, you can see the 30 square mile box inside of that. You see where the five and the three are, that, that line that's drawn there, that box for Baltimore City from 1888 to 1918. And basically, what the city council did once the new land was acquired, they said, well, we'll just spread it out. Uh, the ward system was abolished as a city council representation system in 1922, and what was substituted were council districts. Each council district would have three council members. And council members often represented ward clubs. And of course, it didn't take long for some of the ward clubs to realize we made alliances, we can, we can outvote anything. So they did. And these are the districts that now come into play for a lot of what was to happen. The sixth council district, for example, uh, on the south there, made sure that where I-95 went did the least amount of disruption for its residential areas. It took a while for them to get around to that because they were at first willing to sacrifice the area near the end of Harvard, their portion of it. Uh, <clears throat> The governor of Maryland at this time was from the same political club as the mayor of Baltimore, which was, let me go back quickly, the Fifth District Club. And Fifth District Club had a long history, very unfortunate history, 
of trying to fend off black representation for as long as possible. They had originally controlled the fourth district, uh, and they eventually yielded that to move into the fifth district. So that was, but their approach was anything that gets built is not going to disrupt our people. And because of redistricting, uh, followed by the Supreme Court's one man one vote rule, 1968, Governor of Maryland very much needed support from the suburbs as well as from Baltimore City. So he was willing to listen to a lot of things. Now, who's counting, so to speak, how you get something done in Baltimore City? It's a strong mayor form of government. Mayor at that time needs 10 votes at city council and he gets anything he wants passed. No questions asked, basically. Protests, maybe, but no serious stop. So, the leader of the fifth council district delegation in city council, shown here, including Kaplan, and one of the key opponents is actually seated right in front of him. Obviously, not pleased with what Mr. Kaplan was saying at the time, uh, Emerson Julian. The third council district, which is more East Baltimore, Harvard, and other road quarters, uh, is part of the current organization, which is an old organization in Baltimore City, that goes back to the 19th century. And it's basically a political dynasty in Baltimore City. The sixth council district, the South Side, was known as the Silent Sixth. They didn't say a word in city council debates. They just voted the way they were told to vote. You told them how to vote, and you needed a man right there. His nickname was Soft Shoes and Burger. He was a masterful politician that came to putting things together and making things happen. And he was an ally to Mayor Shaver. The woman he's speaking with is this executive assistant to the mayor. And Lindsay was known by some as Dragon Lady. <laughs> now, that's nine votes. Sixth district, fifth district, and third district. Who's the tenth vote here? And this turns out to be his most reliable tenth vote. Victory now. She's not the woman holding up her hand, taking the oath of office. She's the woman quietly next to her, looking down. Um, she was a civil rights activist. Her husband was the numbers king in Baltimore City at the time when there were no lobbyists that could be. Uh, he was known as Little Willie Adams, and he was said to be worth a million dollars. Back then, I think a million silver dollars, that's a lot of money, especially for a black man. So, Mayor Schaefer was a smart guy. The city had cleared a lot of land in downtown Baltimore for the purpose of redeveloping it under the urban rule plans. They hadn't had any takers for those lots. So the idea was let's turn those into parking lots and let's charge people for parking them. And we'll make it a nice competitive rate. And we'll put lots of parking vans on the street and people aren't allowed to park on the street. And let's lease these lots to a man named Quill, Alan Quill, happens to be the brother of Victorian Adams. Jobs for people, you know, we don't have high school diplomas, yes. The revenue for Quill and the city, and it basically helps cement the alliance. Now, there are the problem people, so sorry, from the administration's point of view. Emerson Julian, Dr. Julian, is a very respected man, he's a medical profession, he's an independent voice. And when he doesn't like something, he says so. And it says it loud and clear, and very articulately on the floor of city council. More of a problem for the mayor became the Mitchell family. Many of you probably heard of him, Clarence Mitchell. Uh, <clears throat> well, Clarence Mitchell's sons included this gentleman, Michael Mitchell, who ran for city council. And also, uh, another relation is Perrin Mitchell, who became congressman in a very close contest in 1970, in which the candidate backed by the fifth council district machine lost very, very narrowly. So there is a sore spot politically in the city administration 
about the Mitchell family. Despite their quite dramatic civil rights records, they moved beyond the let's have immigration facilities to now we want a piece of the economic action in this city. We're not getting it. And they will say it as often as they can and as frequently as they can. Practically, when it comes to dealing with the federal government, a local government like Baltimore's sometimes has problems. How do they like to solve those problems? They like to pick up a telephone and call someone, somebody with influence. So you might call your senator, you might call your congressman. Baltimore City has Congressman Mitchell. This is a problem for Mayor Shea. He can't call Congressman Mitchell if they don't like each other. Really. So he works instead with another congressman, Paul Sarbanes. Now, ironically, Paul Sarbanes was somebody who had opposed some of these highways. But they could at least talk. One thing that really helped to propel what happened uh, in terms of building this highway was the 1968 riot. In April of 1968, Baltimore City, like so many other cities in this country, had some very, very bad race riots because of the assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King. And it made paper headlines, it made television news headlines, it made radio news headlines, and everybody was talking about the city's going to burn the ground. You know, we have problems here, what can we do? The reason we bring these two maps together is <clears throat> after the death of Freddie Gray, some of you may know, there was a, uh, a sharp protest, there was an event referred to as the uprising, and Certain news outlets made a point of making it appear by selectively choosing their footage to air that Baltimore City had slid back to the 1968 riot damage variety. That was not the case. The purpose of this map is basically to say, no, 1968 was not repeated in 2015. There's nothing like that. But what happened in 1968 helped to give people who were outside of the areas where rioting happened, a feeling that wasn't so bad if you tore down some of that stuff for these riders. So what happened? Baltimore City had condemned properties to make way for Interstate 7 to come down to Baltimore City and meet near the inner harbor. The city dropped the plan uh, at the very beginning of the 1970s to link Interstate 70 to I-95 down there, and link it to I-83 down there. So instead, Interstate 70 was basically going to come to an end right between a pair of public housing high-rises, Murphy Homes on the north side, which would be the left side of this picture, and Lexington Terrace on the right side. They basically split the two geographically. They've been kept separate anyway, just for this event, so to speak. And the highway could not connect to Interstate 70 as we know it today, because it planned and needed to go through Eaton Park. And a federal judge ruled that it was environmentally inappropriate to try to use Eaton Park, the highway uh, route. And the city could not afford to do an alternate route, either around the park to the north of it, around the park to the south of it. Or to tunnel under the park. So they dropped that. And we're left with the situation where the mayor is saying we're going to build this. And what they built, of course, the highway to nowhere is being owned today. It had required demolition of 20 blocks of housing and other buildings. We've taken out a couple of public schools, we've taken out a couple of churches, and 970 dwelling units. And of course, the people who have lived in those dwelling units. Had already been made to leave for five to ten years earlier. One of the things that Baltimore City did at that moment in time was also agree, somewhat reluctantly at first, that Highway Trust Fund could be used to build some mass transit facilities for the benefit of the city. The federal government had finally gotten around to authorizing that. Uh, so once again, the city administration still has a lot of clout, 
mayor and the governor are still good political friends, and the city is given power to decide where the new mass transit subway lines are going to be. And more specifically, they're given the authorization to decide which lines get the first. So this was the plan that Baltimore City had for a subway system. As you can see, it's got a lot of legs and a lot of pieces and a lot of stations. And you can see, shown in red, just the thing that's going to be known in our town as the red line. This is what actually got built. The line that was to come down from the northwest into the center of the city, back out to the northeast, was chopped off, originally at downtown in Charles C. <clears throat> Fort East Park and Third Council District wanted nothing to do with this. The Sixth Council District wanted nothing to do with it. The Fifth Council District, which by now had considerable Black population, said, You can come into the Fifth District of this thing, but you're only going to put your stations in Black neighborhoods. So that's exactly what we see this. And the city council president made a very vocal, and angry uh, comment during the city council final debate on the condemnation ordinances that as long as mass transit is seen by some folks around here as black transit, we will never have any progress. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned the public housing high rises for families that were built back in the late 50s. By the time we got to the end of or the middle of the 90s, 1990s, it was clear that these things needed to be torn down. In fact, it was clear back in 1970 that the federal government refused to consider turning down since they were 10 years old. <laughs> uh, but 10 to 15 years old. Nonetheless, the city turned to the planning department and said, let's come up with a new plan for what we can rebuild these places as. What's been interesting to us, uh, study urban evolution, so to speak, is in a sense, the full circle of the real term. What did they go back to? Pretty much version of the cops, right? without the back screen houses. And that's what you have today. These planned unit developments taking place of what were high concentrations Low income black families, children living in high rise buildings, quite frankly, not suitable places for children to be raised. And I think finally, uh, one of the lessons we've learned from all of this was that what happened to Baltimore in terms of its highway building, as well as its slum clearance and its urban building, was that it maintained the concentration of the least well off people. In the entire metropolitan area within Baltimore City. So this is the map we look at today, the wealth map. Suburban areas, by and large, have been very little offices like this. Beltway has served them well, so to speak. But Baltimore City has continued to suffer. If you look at the red pockets, by the way, <clears throat> I always find it interesting in Baltimore County, there's a red pocket up in Towson, that's the university, and there's another red pocket in the southwest, that's also the university. Oh, yeah. so College kids are poor. <laughs> <laughs> and I think with that, I concluded my remarks. Does anybody have any questions yes. both here and or via Zoom? Here we have some, somebody. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, if you can just sort of be a Pollyanna, what do you see um, a result of the million, $2 million uh, funds to study rectifying the SCAR? And, and what would you, as a planner, like to see done with that plan? I, I think the first thing we have to decide is, is it going to continue to be any type of transportation corridor or not? Um, one of the key problems, of course, for a city like Baltimore is people do want to get from point A to point B and sometimes lose passage for somebody else's neighborhood. 
Franklin Street, Mulberry Street were there. Um, they were turning much more than they were originally because they were connected to Edmondson Avenue by a special cut through that you can still see was done by demolishing some houses from the major connection. Edmondson Avenue was connected to Route 40 West, which then leads to the Beltway and Interstate 70 took the place of Route 40 West. So there's always going to be a demand for some type of traffic to come through West Baltimore. The question is where it's most appropriate. As far as that particular uh, squad of land, it would be ideal if it was returned to the extent possible to the way it would have been 100 years ago. <laughs> sort of, again, pipe dream perhaps, um, when there were houses, mostly owner occupied houses, um, some rentals. There were maybe a few factories scattered in there for the churches that were still. And there was not a massive traffic like before. Because the ultimate problem, not just there, but anywhere in Baltimore City, is who really wants to live on a very, very busy street? And ask the same question in East Baltimore on Orleans Street, for example, and such. So there's always going to be a problem with combating the negative effects of a lot of through traffic on the people who want to live there. But that said, if there has to be through traffic, uh, it was possible to uh, lower it in elevation in relation to the surrounding housing, so much the better. There was a plan proposed back in the late 60s to actually build a platform above the highway before it was even built, um, and then build on the platform in the physical structure that theory housing could be built. I can tell you from <clears throat> ironic experience, and I worked in Washington, D.C. for a short time. There's a similar plan down there, very near, of all things, HUD headquarters, Southwest. Oh, and HUD was all in favor of it. Guess who shut it down? EPA. They said the pollution levels that people would be breathing would be intolerable. We would not allow the federal government in any way to subsidize the production of housing, you know, no matter for whom, in a location like that. And that, that put that plan to rest. So I think we have to remember, it isn't just about the housing and the cars, and the motor trucks, all that. There are other factors. And the air pollution is a serious factor, talking about this type of thing. You know, going Pollyanna, let's say we go ahead 25 years and everybody's got an electric vehicle that's theoretically not polluting, maybe it's a different world with that. But we or, have to wait for that to happen. Or maybe we build the red line. Or there's another final trip. Now, the problem with the red line thing is, of course, um, money. The original plan was to have a tunnel, and there's a lot of talk about that. Unfortunately, the red line turned into a, a bus rapid transit line because of money constraints. It's worked well in LA as a concept. It certainly could happen here. And as buses are becoming more and more environmental friendly by the designs of their motors, I think it's something that definitely should be looked at. But we've got to have control over the buses. The city has to have control well, over its buses. That's, another, that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 yes, it's like looking. It's like I, I used the terms of getting us before it makes it boring. But it is a little bit like that. You pull out one strand, you're going to get a whole bunch of other strands coming. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, in light of uh, the question that has been asked, uh, could it be that the street, instead of being a three uh, three lanes uh, both ways, becomes a one lane both ways? So. Uh, the, the idea of the platform with houses on top, would it be feasible, I mean, provided that we can do it structurally, of course, uh, could it be feasible to have an uh, infrastructure that is much more reduced downside sized? Uh, because, um, I don't know, in terms of traffic, would it be possible to downside both lanes, make them maybe one way uh, each way, and still having the idea of having the platform uh, will that be a better solution environmentally speaking? And, and yes, also in the hope that um, electric cars will be a factor in 25 years. Um, it's possible. Uh, I think a big question that always has to be asked is we don't have the luxury necessarily, unless we want to designate it, think of it as a route that trucks are prohibited to use. So we have to consider the needs of Baltimore City as a port. The movement of freight traffic is very important. And 
you have a state and the federal government have been spending a lot of money, as you may have noticed, to try to widen the Beltway from I-70 down to I-95 on the west side of Baltimore County, strictly because of that problem. They got so much traffic over there. And it was predicted long ago that if I-70 was built and the highway to nowhere was not connected <laughs> to that piece, that this would be the result. And it has happened. Uh, the question is, is there another way to move so much freight uh, that won't generate so much uh, negative impact? We have another one. Yeah. I have lots of questions, but I will monopolize. Me neither. Maybe that, is, there any, is there any question? Um, is there any question on uh, online? I also feel there is a Okay, yes, Samia. Samia, you can ask uh, if you like. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so yeah, the history is quite horrific. Uh, moving forward, we know that DOT has gotten a grant, a planning grant for $2 million to plan the reconnected communities and uh, eliminate the problems. Um, what has DOT um, learned from their mistakes and which particular community organization or coalitions are they engaging formally in pursuing the planning? I also put these questions in the chat. So if they're not clear, we can just Yeah, I cannot hear anything. Christina, we lost the feed.
It's a little faint. Question in the chat. The EOT seems to have installed a kind of remediation on the western side of the highway between Harrison and Calhoun. Including plantings, work out equipment, and a path. Can you speak to how this is done, planning the funding, and if there are plans to extend these improvements to the rest of the space? Again, unfortunately, I do not know how that was done because I have not been a part of the department's consultation. Uh, I'm fairly certain that they would have received some type of federal support for that. I do not recall seeing this in the city's capital improvement budget, but it may have been included in one of the items that the Department of Transportation got the city to approve a few years back. In terms of planning it, I believe that was done by a landscape architect. I do not know who that was. Other questions? No, not in the chat. So I do have one question related to the uh, new plan, the cost of the new plan, right? A number of years to involve the communities in all types of planning decisions all across the city. Getting you know, those internet connections is just <laughs> may or may not go through. Back question. Uh, <clears throat> the, there are a number of communities on both sides of Highway to Nowhere, and they obviously are going to need to get together in ways they might not have done before. <laughs> The plan together how to reuse that strip of land. The planning department is likely to participate in that. It's fortunately all within our West Planning District. And the community planner will certainly do the utmost 
to ensure that the people involved work together. There is a portion of the area that is also in our southwest planning district, and those two planners certainly work together. They work together for quite a while. And units eventually will close, depending on how long this takes. There are new people involved, and we would expect this to be of the plan itself may or may not have any planning changes, but the way it has to be discussed. Could it be a competition and just an equitable option? Again, the Department of Transportation is uh, managing the grant. I don't know what the grant rules are as far as how they can develop the plan mm -hmm. if they want to call it. Um, the other thing is the plan may call for things like this. Competition for specific developments yeah. that would replace those very needs. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, I, I would say, is that that would involve not just the Department of Transportation, but probably the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Planning Board. Mm -hmm. Is there a timeline? Don't know that. For seeing there is. We need to get federal money and federal money to use it. Yeah, and it's not going to be even close to that. I don't have it. Any question in the audience? Not in the chat. Um, in the chat. Well, there's people who uh, I do have a friend, very curious. <laughs> so you said um, we might involve communities in ways, and the communities will have to come together in ways that they, they probably never had. Could you give us an example of what what you, you can imagine happening? I would think. Um, one of the things I look at as an example is some of the planning issues that would happen with the red line bargain action uh, development concept. Um, there were meetings weekly, uh, all day on a Saturday, for example, at the, the large school building that they were holding quite a lot of people. And people worked around tables together, and there was definitely effort made to mix. People from one community and people from another community, as many as possible, but to keep them around the table. Um, and then at the same time, it worked people from six or eight people around the table to see what the country would look like. And um, then at the end, the groups would report out what they were seeing there, basically. Um, it's quite possible that we several share well, not all of them, more of them well. And I could easily see that happening simply by segmenting if it was a strip. Not segmenting the strip into several pieces and having a strip for each piece. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One other player I haven't mentioned yet, potentially it would involve the development of the uh, very obvious attraction of the business there. Obviously, uh, there may be opportunities along that strip. Where it's a business that's creating as well, especially if it would be with the people in the Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Dion, for, um, for all your questions and being here, Arjen. Uh, this concludes uh, this presentation, I suppose. Have a nice afternoon. Uh, nice to meet you, everybody. Bye. I'll be in the chat. Come on. Uh, Please send it out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.